Hello and welcome to the Amherst Weekly Report with Amherst Media. I'm Asia Reed. And I'm Karan Chaudhary. Songs, prayers, and interfaith reflections will bring together those who are calling for peace in Ukraine and Yemen, as well as other places experiencing war around the world. The Rally for Peace will be held Sunday at 12 p.m. at the Mount Toby Friends Meeting in Leverett. The event, organized by the Immigrant Solidarity and Race and Class Groups, will begin with a silent vigil along North Pleasant and Main Street. At the rally, speakers and performers will share their reflections on the latest war and will confront the very catastrophes that it has caused. Sister Claire Carter from the New England Peace Pagoda and Dr. Ira Helfand of Northampton are featured speakers at the event. Dr. Helfand has already stated her concerns regarding the war. She said in an email to the Gazette, quote, We are closer to nuclear war than we ever have been. While our ability to influence the current situation is very limited, if we are lucky enough to survive this crisis, we must make sure that we are never again in a situation like this. The International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War has released a petition that calls for Russia and NATO to reject their usage of nuclear weapons in the war. The petition can be found at www.ippnw.org. A community development project involving the construction of 28 small studio apartments for low-income individuals is expected to begin by mid-March. More than a third of the apartments will be set aside for those who have recently recently been homeless. The housing project is set for construction at 132 Northampton Road in Amherst and will be called East Gables. The development received a comprehensive permit under the state's chapter 40B law in November 2020. With support through state funding from the Department of Housing and Community Development, the largest source will be tax credits from the Low Income Housing Tax Program. More than $700,000 was also provided by the town through the Community Preservation Act and $50,000 from the Amherst Housing Authority. The Amherst Town Council rejected the solar project moratorium this Monday, meaning solar projects are allowed to proceed under the current zoning rules. Before the final vote, the council had several different views. Some had a strong dislike for a moratorium because putting off the project would release more greenhouse gas emissions into the air. However, those in support of the moratorium said it would not prohibit brownfield development, solar over parking lots, rooftop solar, or projects that have already been started. Other councillors also supported the moratorium because it would allow for more time to create a comprehensive bylaw for industrial solar. Some were hesitant about the project altogether. Installing solar panels means that forests will have to be cut down, and this may out- outweigh the benefits of solar panels. The final vote was 8-5 to five in a favor of a moratorium. The council was one vote away from being able to adopt the zoning change. This would have put an end to any project generating 250 kilowatts of power until May. Currently, Amherst and Hampshire County as a whole have the highest number of COVID-19 cases per capita in Massachusetts, despite the decline in people contracting COVID. According to the Amherst COVID dashboard that is updated every Thursday, 150.8 cases per 100,000 residents were recorded over the past two weeks. Hampshire County was at 60.3 cases per 100,000 residents, higher than any other county. Town manager, Paul Buckelman and Health Director Jennifer Brown issued a statement which said, With the large concentration of college students and the comprehensive testing requirements of the colleges and university, Amherst is unique in the number of town residents who are being tested on a regular basis. This past week, I spoke with a Western Mass local who showed me the ins and outs of woodworking from home. He cuts, he builds, and he admires. Woodworker Eric Sheriff spends days on end, even sometimes 10 hours a day, inside his West Brookfield wood shop. Started pretty much from from high school. You know, as a kid, I was always playing with like Lincoln Logs, Legos, you know, I always had a build. I was always very mechanically inclined. I like to take, you know, I look at a piece of wood and say, you know, what can I make out of it? Kind of like, like a sculptor that's looking at a block of marble. And that sculptor can see a, a work of art hidden underneath the stone. So I kind of see that with my with, with, with wood. His wife, Kathy, is the polar opposite. No interest in using those power tools, but I am the muscle whenever he needs to move a piece of furniture. Every room in Eric's home has a custom-made piece with its own unique flair and craftsmanship, not something you can get at the store. Anything that I make, it's, it's solid wood. You know, what most people don't realize when they go to a store these days, 
and a lot of it's veneered pressed wood. It, it may look pretty on the outside, but on the inside, it's, it's, it's garbage, and people are paying a lot of money for this stuff. With over 50 pieces made so far, Eric is just getting started. His pieces began as gifts to his nieces, but now that he is retired, he has time to pursue his passion full time. Asia Reed, Amherst Media, West Brookfield. In an email sent out to the UMass campus community from the co-directors of the Public Health Promotion Center, effective Wednesday, March 9th at 7 a.m., the campus lifted its indoor mask requirement. The university said that there has been significant improvement in the public health environment on campus, despite the county's number of highest COVID cases per capita in the state. The university's decision follows a recent guidance from the CDC and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. A caucus to elect delegates for the state Democratic Convention took place on Sunday. The caucus occurred virtually to elect those who will represent Amherst at the upcoming convention, which will be held on June 3rd and 4th at the DCU Center in Worcester. At the convention, candidates for statewide positions such as Governor, Attorney General, Secretary of State and State Auditor will be endorsed before the primary in September. According to their website, the Amherst Democrats regularly hold meetings, annual caucuses, and a number of other events focused on connecting Democrats and taking action. The town's new elementary school plans could exceed over $100 million. The number came from the initial cost estimates brought to the elementary school building committee on Friday. The plans could range from nearly $94 million to $100.3 million in order to create a building that meet the town's net zero energy use bylaws. Donna Dinesco of Dinesco Design stated that the number should be seen as, quote, extremely preliminary. The cost estimates will depend on whether the final decision is to construct an entirely new building or a renovation and addition at either the Fort River or Wildwood Elementary School sites. The new construction project would likely be completed for fall 2026, but the renovation would not be completed until later. According to the plans, work at Fort River could cost $2 million more than Falwood due to there being more available green space for playing fields. The cost of the school is also expected to be high due to the requirements for a net zero building. Photovoltaics and geothermal systems are pricey as the geothermal systems could cost $3.8 million for the source of heating and cooling the building. At-large counselor Alicia Walker, who also serves on the school building committee, expressed her concern that if the costs of the project are too high, residents of limited means might have to leave town if they're unable to pay of or afford higher taxes or increased rents. It is currently unknown how much of the cost will be the town's taxpayers' responsibility versus how much will be covered by the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Now, here's Tyler with this week's sports report. Thanks, Karen. There was cause for celebration across UMass this week as Minute Women Basketball took down Dayton for the A-10 Women's Crown. UMass won 62-56, being led as usual by a 19-point outing from Sam Breen, who also led the team in rebounding with nine boards. Bernia Mayo, Sidney Taylor, and McKenna White all scored in the double digits as well, contributing to an overall team victory that secures the Minute Women, Minute Women their first ever A-10 championship and their first berth into the NCAA tournament since 1998. They won't know their seed or their opponent in the tournament until Sunday night, though it's likely they'll fall somewhere between the 10-12 to 12 seed based on their NCAA net computer ranking. In the meantime, it's time to bring out the champagne, or the sparkling apple cider, as the champions return to campus with their eyes set on an even grander prize. UMass men's basketball finished their regular season strong after a string of losses with a victory over George Mason, taking over in overtime to win 83-80. Veteran scorer Noah Fernandez dropped a career-high 28 points in the contest, with Rich Kelly following suit with 20 of his own. This win propels the Minutemen to a first-round bye in the A-10 tournament, where they'll hope to mirror the success of their men and women counterparts, starting with a matchup against George Washington on March 10th. Here's to hoping that we get to celebrate two A-10 championship trophies being brought back to Amherst in the coming weeks. The Amherst College women's basketball team advanced to the Sweet 16 for the 14th consecutive season on Saturday, following a 56-48 victory over St. John Fisher College. Gabrielle Zafiro was the star of the show, dropping a team-high 13 points with freshman Anling Varuk following close behind with 12. 
Their next opponent will be against rival Tufts at a location that will be announced on Sunday. Of the team's 14 consecutive trips to the Sweet 16, the Mammoths have eight semifinals appearances and three national championships to their name. Moving on to the Amherst High School boys basketball, that team found themselves in a Division II state tournament as well, falling to Drake at 59-51. Senior Evan Stewart led the team with 22 points, but even his scoring downpour was not enough to stop Drake from stealing the victory. The team finished 15-6 with a pair of losses in the beginning, middle, and end of the season, being the only stains on an otherwise great outing. After losing a doubleheader against Boston College over the weekend, the UMass Minutemen Hockey find themselves entering the Hockey East quarterfinals as the two-seed behind Northeastern, with a game against an undetermined opponent coming up on the horizon on March 12th. The team finished their season 19-12-2 with a conference record of 14-8-2, with a lot of these losses ultimately coming down to untimely mistakes or untimely injuries. The Minutemen remain a powerhouse in the Hockey East, even if their performances haven't necessarily been as dominant as many UMass students had come to expect. And with this time between their games against BC and their game in the quarterfinals, I fully expect them to come back well-rested and in championship, fo championship form. The Hockey East tournament is single elimination, so every game from here on out is the difference between failure and a back-to-back -back championship rally. If they can keep their mistakes in the rear view and stay composed on the ice, they very well could be the team to beat in the HEA tournament. Back to you, Asia. Thanks, Tyler. And thank you for tuning in to the Amherst Weekly Report with Amherst Media. I'm Asia Reed, And I'm Karan Chaudhary. We will see you again at the same time next week.